discuss the 19 fiscal year municipal budget. As many of you know, since several copies of the budget have been uh, taken from Town Hall over the last couple of weeks, at the moment, the total budget for municipal and county services is projected to be in the ballpark of $4,021,540, which is about $278,000, or 6.5% less than last year's budget. The projected non-property tax revenues are at a level of $1,651,500, which is about $388,000, or 19% less than last year. The projected tax rate is $4.16, which is 20 cents, or 5% more than last year. I underscore the fact that these particular numbers are tentative, they're the numbers that we have to work with at the moment as we review uh, all of the accounts with respect to the municipal government in Cape Elizabeth today. I'm sure most of you are completely clear about who's at this table, the town councilors, uh, and our town manager, Michael McGovern. I will ask Michael for a couple of thoughts at this point as we begin our deliberations. I I'd just like to start by thanking the department heads. Uh, I think it was, it was an extremely difficult process this year. Uh, I think any time you look at a budget, you, have, you end up with a reduction in just simply municipal services of almost 8%. Uh, there are a lot of things that we'd like to have in the budget that, that simply are not there. Uh, and I think I'm in the awkward position this year of uh, perhaps having to argue for cuts that I don't believe in. Uh, if, if I had my way, I, I wouldn't had a single item out of the budget that had been in there last year, I think it would have been important to continue. But nonetheless, the council did get a directive that uh, the, the budget was to increase no more than 5%. And uh, you know, during the, the finance committee deliberations, you, you are going to have to give a lot of concern and a, a lot of uh, thought to uh, exactly what that does to, to the municipal side of the budget. And, uh, you know, I hope that as this day goes on and the other sessions go on, you, you'll remember that, uh, that as tough as these budget cuts are, uh, some budget cuts are necessary if we're to stay within that 5% uh, cap that you set. So it uh, should be an interesting time, and I think uh, I can speak for all the department heads and myself. But, uh, look forward to working with you and look forward to April 8th when this budget is due to be adopted. Thank you very much, Michael. Well, why don't we start then with account 210, which is the uh, police department. I'll ask the chief of police, David Pickering, to join us at this point and discuss his proposed 1992 budget. <coughs> what I'm going to ask each department head to do at the beginning is to sort of provide a general overview of their entire budget and then to go into the, the line by line details as the finance committee does. Mr. Chair, if I could have the uh, record reflected because Councilor Reed and I addressed a lot, it doesn't suggest any conspiracy on our part. <laughs> so noted. <laughs> so noted. Uh, Billy, could you possibly send that microphone down to the chief to get a better. Uh, you think he needs an audible? Well, just in case. Senate hearing, isn't it? <coughs> well, I guess first up, I've, uh, I'm going to be uh, saying things you'll hear most of the day today is that we've had a, a difficult time putting this budget together. Uh, we have cut services, I'll tell you right up front, in, in preparing this. Uh, the budget will, will center on, on one basic issue as far as I'm concerned, and that is the, the issue of one position that has been proposed to be cut uh, to get us down to an acceptable level. Uh, overall, this budget is up. It includes, by the way, the police department, the dispatching services, uh, and animal control. It is up about 1.5%, uh, a little less than 1.5% uh, over last year. 
I think it's important to remember as we go through the police department budget that, uh, number one, we're the only 24-hour emergency service, full-time emergency service uh, in town. <coughs> Secondly, 83 percent of this budget is uh, relates to salary-related accounts. I don't have any large capital outlay uh, that I can go to to uh, pare down these numbers. If I'm going to affect this budget in terms of, of bringing it in uh, in line, then I've got to affect positions. There's just no way around that. And we've done that uh, reluctantly on a couple of occasions. Uh, I will also propose to you not cutting a position that's uh, been suggested here uh, in lieu of, of another position and reducing that one to part-time. That will become clear as I go along. Um, basically, this is the, the first year uh, that we've had to do this, in my memory. This is the 12th budget that I've put together. Uh, and without exception, every year I'm told to keep a sharp pencil and have for the last 12 years. So when you're asked to uh, bring a budget in uh, under last year, then it certainly suggests that you're going to have to cut services to do it, and unfortunately uh, we've done that here. So I guess what, what I want the, the Finance Committee to recognize is what the results of this is going to be, of what we can ex expect in, uh, in, in services or in lesser services, to see if that's going to be acceptable to you as a Finance Committee and, and to the community. Mr. Chairman, we're going item by item through this. Do you want to... Uh, I think that'd be the any particular. Two. All right. <coughs> uh, to begin administrative payroll account, uh, the request for fiscal 1992 is $75,085. That includes uh, two positions, my position as chief of police and the captain's position, which we are uh, currently in the process of, uh, of filling as our captain. Uh, former captain is uh, now the police chief in Gorham, as you know. That reflects a 5 percent pay increase, which um, um, telegraphs what the contracted pay increases for the other uh, members of the department are, and what I suspect, expect the uh, uh, increases throughout the town will be. Uh, the full-time payroll account, and this is the area where I want to talk about the position, and I will defer to you whether or not you want to make that an issue at this point or if you want to come back to it uh, after we've gone through the entire budget. Why don't you just do it right now? All right. Again, this account is, is the biggest, largest account that I have of, of uh, some 35. Uh, you'll notice last year, we, we, or the projection for 1991 uh, suggests a deficit. And that very simply is a result of underfunding one position last year. Uh, we should have had around $260,000 to cover this account. This, by the way, covers uh, three patrol sergeants and uh, presently seven uh, officers, or six officers and one detective. We've adjusted that uh, to provide, provide for that uh, additional position or that position next year. Um, the detective's position is part of that number, as I mentioned. The way that we proposed to pare down this number uh, was to eliminate that, and I was not in favor of that. Michael and I had uh, several discussions about it. Um, still not, and I think I have a viable alternative for that. Uh, but to discuss the real impact of what the elimination of that position would, would mean, uh, I prepared a, a brief summary of, of the impacts that I see uh, coming out of it. The detective's position was created as a part-time position four years ago. Uh, we ran as a part-time uh, position for two years, and two years ago, we elevated it to a full-time position uh, after debate with the council, and I believe that we've improved services considerably by doing that. Uh, in 1987, our crime clearance rate was 13%, 13 of, uh, of 100 part one crimes, and those are the more serious offenses. Uh, they include uh, murder, rape, robbery, assault, theft, motor vehicle theft, and arson uh, are included in those numbers. We were clearing 13 out of 100 of them. Uh, the next year of the part-time position, we cleared 18 percent. After that position was elevated to a full-time position, uh, we cleared 24 percent. 
and in 1990, the number that we have applied uh, to the state uh, through the UCI reports is some 36 percent. Uh, I think that alone suggests the value of this position and how it impacts on the community. And again, that will be clear as we, we go through these uh, bullets here. Uh, without the, yes. We, this past year, we had 192 Part 1 crimes. That does not include uh, nuisance offenses. It doesn't include criminal mischief. It doesn't include trespass. Uh, they are the more serious uh, felony or, or Part 1 offenses, which we are required by, by law to provide the state yearly, actually on a monthly basis and uh, in a yearly report. Um, Chief, do you know what the property value recovered was in of the amount of crimes that we solve, of course, because uh, depending on what uh, what the value of each offense is, um, I can get those numbers for you for the last couple of years. I wouldn't want to, want to guess on what that is. Mm -hmm. Several thousand dollars, certainly. The first thing I think that the Finance Committee should recognize is that we, if this position is eliminated uh, or reduced to part-time, which would be the proposal under this, the budget, uh, we would be unable to ensure continuity in criminal investigations by dedicating a single officer uh, to criminal complaints. Uh, it's important for a detective or an investigator to develop a sense about the neighborhood, <coughs> a, a, sense about, uh, a sense about the methods of operation that particular criminals use, um, what uh, property is being targeted. Uh, right now we have a rash of burglaries going on that are targeting uh, silver in the uh, northern end of town. And that kind of information is something that you acquire with experience uh, in the position. And I think it's very necessary to, to do an adequate job in, uh, in dealing with this, with these responsibilities. Second thing is that we would have to assign patrol officers to work rotating shifts, who work rotating shifts to follow up on criminal complaints. We have always worked rotating shifts here, uh, at least in my tenure. I think the town gets a great benefit by that. But if we were to assign uh, criminal investigations to these particular officers, it would be very, very difficult uh, to have proper follow-up. The first thing that invariably happens, and we, we experienced this when the position was part-time, is that uh, an officer that was investigating a case on, th on uh, 3 to 11 shift moved to the 11 to 7 shift, uh, worked midnights, in, in fact. So if somebody wanted to call up with a question about that particular case, and that officer was unavailable for the two-week period until they rotated out of the, the late shift and on, on onto days. Uh, very, very difficult situation. In, in terms of trying to follow up these, these particular cases. Well, we could not prepare any individual officer with an advanced level of training in crime scene search, evidence collection, fingerprinting, photography, interviewing and interrogation techniques, criminal case preparation, juvenile intake procedures, drug investigations, child abuse investigation, and report writing necessary to provide the level of service that we currently provide. Uh, in the 17 years that I've been with the police department here, we've gone from uh, the dungeons of technology really to, I think, uh, the forefront of, of science and investigative techniques, and that's happened all throughout the state, I think. Uh, if this position is something that, that requires a, a, a high level of skill, uh, not only to be successful in prosecuting cases, but also to protect us from civil suits. Uh, you know, when you affect somebody's liberties, as a detective does uh, quite frequently, as all the officers do, to be sure, uh, the potential for, uh, for civil suits is, is real, uh, and I'm proud to say that we have had no successful civil suits uh, in my tenure, and I think it's as a result of this kind of training that, be, that we are able to provide. Predictably, we would solve 50 percent fewer crimes based on uniform crime reports for the, for the past four years. And again, that, that goes back to what I was saying earlier, that uh, initially uh, we were solving around 13 to 18 percent of the crimes reported to us, and last year we solved 36 percent. So I think it would follow that if the, if the position was reduced to part time again, then about half of those crimes would not be solved. Chief, could I just get a clarification for a moment? Because uh, the way your pa uh, paper here is uh, constructed, it assumes that the statistics you're talking about, unless you make a particular point, are that the detective position would be eliminated entirely? No, it assumes it would be reduced to part time. It's assuming that it's roughly a 20 hour a week situation. Mm -hmm. All these numbers that are based on the position being part time, not right. being eliminated. That's correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
I guess as far as this point goes, I wanted to impress the fact that, that this is a measurable benefit to the town, and sometimes it's difficult as far as positions go to really determine what we're getting for our dollar. Uh, but here's a situation where uh, we were able to measure the success of that position and, and how it reflected uh, directly on the community. <coughs> so when you, if we expect we're going to have 50 percent fewer crimes solved, then we're going to have roughly 30 or 40 households uh, that would also not be satisfied because we have not uh, developed a solution to that particular crime. <coughs> Excuse me. Chief, can I just ask one mm -hmm. other clarification? Um, again, as you're going through these particular worsening scenarios with respect to crimes cleared, does this assume that no one else in your department then would be doing the detective's work? Unfortunately, if we reduce this to part-time, uh, that is going to be shared with other responsibilities. And when we get down to the financial uh, side of this, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see my point a little bit clearer. Uh, one important part of the detective's job is that he acts as court officer. That takes one full day a week. So even though the detective's position is full-time right now, he still only has four days to conduct investigations. Uh, if we reduce it to part-time, he would have less than two, about, about one and a half days that he would have to conduct uh, extended criminal investigations. We would not have consistent representation at area task force meetings where information on countywide uh, criminal activity is exchanged. Presently, that happens at least monthly, sometimes bi-monthly. Uh, I think it's important to have one officer that develops a liaison with other investigators, uh, either in neighboring communities or other, uh, other communities throughout Cumberland County. Uh, I can give an example about three weeks ago, through one of these task force meetings, our detective was talking with an investigator in Scarborough. Uh, who learned of a subject that had gone to a business out there uh, with a couple of stolen credit cards. Uh, to collectively, they worked to, de to uh, determine who the subject was. In fact, we had two subjects from the Cape who had uh, stolen several credit cards, gone out, made several thousand dollars worth of purchases of electronic equipment. Uh, we were able to develop that information, recover the equipment, get the cards back, make the arrest, and in fact, got information from those two suspects which uh, went to solve other crimes. So it's that kind of exchange, I think, that's important to this position and why it's necessary to have one person dedicated to it rather than a hodgepodge of people that are doing the investigations. We would not have an officer dedicated to act as liaison in district and superior court to meet with assistant district's attorney to prepare criminal cases and juvenile intake documents to handle arraignments and to process warrants, subpoenas, and other court records. <coughs> if you think like things are going too well in your life, go into Ninth District Court on a Friday morning. Uh, it is a literal zoo, uh, and that's what all of the officers call it. In fact, I think that's what uh, several people who work there call it. Um, it's a very difficult bureaucratic jumble that we have to go through. So complicated has this become that if our detective is expected to be off on our court day when we do arraignments, we reschedule court. We write no summonses. We, make, uh, we give no arraignment dates for that particular day because no one else in the department can keep up with it. It's continually changing. Uh, when the new courthouse kicks into effect here in a couple of months, you're going to have all of that turnaround time that's going to be uh, difficult to get back up to speed uh, on. So uh, court work is a very, very difficult operation that we have to have somebody dedicated to. And is I would it possible, expect, Chief, for the captain to serve in that function? Uh, the captain works a rotating shift also, and uh, because it's important for me to have someone on, on day shifts on the weekend when I'm not available that wouldn't fit into that schedule. Uh, there's one day a week when he works with me, and this would be a day shift, and that's Wednesday. Uh, so, and it cannot, we cannot rearrange that schedule because he's part of the rotation. He works the road and has that responsibility. Uh, complaints could, would not be assured of, con complainants not be assured of contacting an investigating officer working a case. Uh, appreciate the frustration of having your home burglarized. Uh, either developing a new piece of information or, or just simply wanting to call the investigating officer and ask him a, a question and finding out that that person is uh, on a different shift or that they're on vacation or that uh, uh, someone else has had to take the case over because of other commitments that that officer has. Again, it suggests it's important to have one person that's dedicated to this effort. We would not have an officer dedicated to refer questions to regarding court appearances, case statuses, and coordinate the processing of insurance claims and accident reports. The detective does much more than investigate and do the court work. Uh, we tend to use that position for all of these other questions and comments that come into play uh, with, with law enforcement. 
the tragedy that we had on New Year's Eve has brought about no less than seven lawyers and four insurance adjusters uh, for that one case where the detective either had to meet with or prepare documents for. Uh, that particular investigative report is nearly 100 pages long. That case alone takes a great deal of time, and, and we have other cases, of course, that uh, can be equally complicated, which uh, requires him to have that responsibility to meet with those, those individuals. We would not be able to consistently carry out special investigations with Biden and other drug enforcement units. Biden is a Bureau of Intergovernmental Drug Enforcement. Uh, in the past two years, we've worked over one dozen of these investigations involving two dozen drug traffickers and recovering over $30,000 in uh, illicit drug profits. You recall a couple of years ago on Mitchell Road, uh, a case that uh, our detective worked with Bide agents. We ended up arresting an individual there, uh, recovering more than $10,000 in that one case alone. Also, uh, an assault weapon and several other firearms inside the house. That individual, when we went into that property, uh, had a mattress on the floor and guns and ammunition, and that is it. And he was had taken up residency here for no other purpose than to sell cocaine, which he did by a pager system where someone would page him and he would go out to the edge of Mitchell Road and sell it. Uh, a case like this does not turn up overnight. You know, we take a great deal of time in preparing these kinds of things. Three weeks ago, as you might have read in the Cape Courier, we arrested three other people, uh, along with Biden agents, off off of Alder Road. That's not where the violation took place. Uh, that's where the arrest was made. But it demonstrates that these kinds of things are ongoing. And again, uh, that particular case, we had been working uh, over a month with Biden agents. How many total hours would you guess the detective put into that particular? That that particular case there. Uh, I'd say probably eight, probably eight throughout that, that period of time that we investigated. We would not have an officer assigned to routinely check pawn shops, suspected fences, and other outlets of stolen merchandise. Yesterday afternoon, the detective came back from Portland uh, and had with him several hundred dollars worth of jewelry that he'd recovered at a pawn shop. Uh, he was able to meet with the complainant who had been burglarized uh, a week or so ago and uh, got information that, they, that uh, material could be in there. She went in and identified that, and because of that, we were able to recover that property. Uh, turnaround time, of course, is quite short when it comes to stolen property, and I think it's necessary to have somebody that can work with Portland's uh, officers that, that handle the pawn shop details, uh, as well as developing the other information as to uh, outlets of stolen merchandise throughout the, the greater Portland area. I think this is also an important point to remember, that we would not be able to dedicate as much attention to special stakeout details at Fort Williams, Crescent Beach, and Kettle Cove. Uh, this is especially important considering that Fort Williams and Kettle Cove details have been eliminated in this budget. Uh, you probably recall we've had several uh, motor vehicle breaks, uh, predictably, during the summer. Uh, those details that, that we have proposed to eliminate uh, spend a good deal of time working those particular offenses. What I would expect to do if this position was retained as a full-time position was utilize that officer more in stakeout capacities in those areas and to act as a, uh, a little bit of buffer or a supplement to the regular patrols uh, in an attempt to keep that criminal activity uh, to a tolerable level, at least. <coughs> the financial considerations, and, and Mike uh, quite correctly has, has given you uh, a response to my memo to him. Uh, when we look at these positions, the only thing that I consider is base wages. We do not consider uh, the cost of benefits. And that is his responsibility, which he has, has noted to you. Uh, I did want to make two comments about that, however. <coughs> it compares the cost of our, our present utility position with that of a detective's position. Uh, and I noted that it didn't provide monies for uh, insurances, and it didn't provide money for retirement. Uh, that I assume it's because the utility officer at this point has, has elected not to have those benefits. And if I'm wrong, Mike, uh, please correct me. Uh, should that utility officer, for whatever reason, elect to take insurance, I assume we'd be obligated to pay it. Uh, he presently has uh, other outside insurance, which is, uh, has a great, greater benefit package than, than we provide. Uh, if for whatever reason it should be eliminated, uh, we could add on a like amount of money uh, to that position for that. And if that person elected uh, to end a state retirement, uh, as he was an employee before uh, the town elected to, to get out of the state retirement system, I assume that we would have to pay those benefits. Or at any rate, we would have to pay a deferred compensation plan. 
Uh, my point is, but for the stroke of the pen, I think we could be a lot closer to a zero-sum game when it comes to these two positions. Right now, uh, we're about $7,000, uh, or we need about $7,000 to make this uh, balance out. We want to make the two positions equally, uh, equally worth, worth keeping. That would be reduced to something like uh, $2,000, I assume, if he elected to take those two benefits. Uh, it also mentions training would be involved here, and that is an important consideration, although if we kept this position as a full-time position, that allows us a lot of latitude in terms of, of uh, what, we're, what, what we can do to fill uh, training time and, uh, and other overtime. So I would not expect that we would have to pay anything in the way of overtime to train another individual. Uh, the expenses that we do have to consider is the, is the course cost, the cost of the actual Criminal Justice Academy, which is about $250, uh, and we do pay mileage at about $400. So uh, for less than $750, uh, we could take care of the training of this particular position. With, as far as the financial considerations go, without the detective's position, we'd have no option or latitude uh, in replacing shifts. Again, this Can is I the... Can I just for a moment again, and I apologize for <coughs> the confusion, but... We keep going back and forth from the yellow sheets to the white sheets, and we have this position that's completely eliminated or it's half time, but then we keep coming back to when it's full time as a full time salary. And I'm continuing in my confusion in terms of the points that you are trying to make with regard to eliminating this position versus having it a half time position. All of these points are, are considering that is, is being proposed to reduce it to half time. Okay, so. All of these proposals are. Mm -hmm. okay. Nowhere have we considered eliminating it entirely. This is all considering that it would be reduced to a half time position. Okay? Yeah, but but you're, uh, let's remove any confusion. Mm -hmm. You would remove, you would take the detective position from full time to half time. Right. But, e but the net reduction in the department staffing level would still be one full time position. Exactly. That's correct. In other words, half of that person's responsibilities would be for investigation. The other half of his responsibilities would be to work the road. But we would eliminate that one position. The, the other point on, you know, if you look at the white sheets, uh, you know, the, the chief is correct that, you know, presently the incumbent in the utility position, uh, because he's retired from the federal government, doesn't uh, utilize our health insurance and doesn't participate in our retirement. At some point that could be funded. And coming up with this sheet, I wanted to show the council exactly the real life situation of this budget and that if you adopted the chief's suggestion uh, to do this, what the actual cost was to this year's budget. Because I, I, I don't think that utility position, the incumbent in it is going to be leaving the next year, nor do I, nor do I think he's going to elect those benefits. So you know, I, I took the chance in the budget that he wouldn't and those have not been funded. If you did fund the detective position, you would have to add in the whole differential. The chief. Uh, you know, in coming up with the numbers does, you know, say with the shortfall and it's quoting numbers, but I think as, as you look at that sheet that you received in your packet Thursday night, it shows that in order to accomplish that, one of the things is the, the elimination of a replacement police cruiser. So, you know, again, that's just a one-year savings, something that would have to come back next year. So, you know, I think as you look at the numbers, uh, I think it's important to look at the, the point the chief is making in terms of sometimes we may have to pick up the benefits for the utility position, as well as the fact that sometimes we have to, you know, not sometimes, that the very next year we have to go up to two cruises again. So, you know, I think as in this issue and as in every single issue you're going to face today, you're, you're going to have a, a whole lot of uh, financial issues coming from, you know, like incoming uh, from, from one side or the other. And, uh, eventually you're going to have to balance this all out. I, I would like to say, I think, you know, the Chief makes a, a very good case, uh, you know, for for the need uh, to maintain its present staffing level. And, uh, you know, I, I reiterate again that, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if this was a perfect world and we had all the resources we could, uh, I would strongly recommend that this position be funded. But, it, you know, we're trying to reduce the budget that's $700,000 less than what we hope to do. And uh, I did have to look clearly at positions that, uh, particularly ones that had been, that we had gotten away without <coughs> or over 
200 DAs on the, the positions that are proposed to be eliminated have only been added in in the last five years. Again, just to echo Michael's thoughts, I think that as all of us uh, independently are going through our pluses and minuses throughout the day, what we don't want to get into is, uh, you know, another story of unfunded mandates, uh, finding at the end of the day that we're, uh, you know, saying yes uh, to a variety of requests without the uh, monies being available to meet them. And I, for one, uh, do not anticipate the uh, municipal budget rising more than 5%, which is the level, uh, the projected increase at the, at the present time. Uh, if anything, I'd be delighted to see a little bit less. Uh, so again, just speaking for one person of the council, uh, perhaps just a reminder that we need to be always aware of if there is going to be a $7,000 shortfall in this particular position, somehow we've got to find that $7,000 today. Please, Thank you. Uh, I guess that, that's a perfect lead-in for the, for the second, and, and I'll try to make this as brief as I can. I know you've got a long agenda today. Uh, the second part of this, this position uh, is the financial considerations of, <coughs> of not uh, replacing this particular officer. And I think it's important to note that we'll have no option or latitude uh, when it comes to replacing shifts if, if this position is not filled. What happens right now is things are going quite well. Uh, we have an officer that can take up those uh, particular positions or those, those jobs um, to fill vacation holidays, things of that nature. Where the difficulty lies is when things that we can't predict come into play, and that is if we have an extended uh, criminal investigation or what have you. Uh, and again, this is a 24-hour emergency, full-time emergency service. Uh, this isn't a situation like construction or, or what have you where uh, we can put off doing a job until we have enough people to do it. It's something that, that is necessary, it's something that is uh, immediate, uh, and something that requires uh, immediate attention when, when these particular situations come up. We don't have the latitude of running a lot of shifts light. Uh, the day shift is about the only time I dare to do that. We don't do that on early shift, 3 to 11, and we do not do it on 11 to 7 shift. Uh, we would pay overtime at a rate of $20 per hour or $160 per shift for every extended criminal investigation that we have. Uh, the detective alone logged 60 hours on the, the New Year's Eve uh, fatal accident. Uh, that one case alone would have cost $1,200 if we hadn't had that full-time detective. Now, I, I certainly hope we never have a case like that again, but I think it's relatively uh, sure that we will have some type of extended criminal investigation. I have put $2,000 in this budget uh, for investigations. That's 100 hours. Uh, not a lot of time for a year, and I've got to assume that we're going to go beyond that, but that was the most uh, uh, realistic number that I could come up with, and, and one that uh, uh, fit in with the agenda, uh, the 5% figure that, that we worked with. Uh, Part-time position would, would give us less than three days per week uh, in the off-season to handle investigations, and one of those days has got to be dedicated to court, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we, would be, we would pay the same overtime rate for any extended sick leave coverage. We have an officer going out on a work-related injury March 5th. You know, we might assume that that never happens. Uh, but next week, I have an officer that will be going out for a work-related injury for four months. And to show you the kind of character of police officers that you have in this town, when uh, his physician told him he had to go in for surgery, he came to me and asked me what would be the least the least convenient, inconvenient time for us to uh, schedule his surgery. Uh, had he elected to take that time off in July, I'd had to fill all of his shifts with overtime if we did not replace his position. And that would have cost us uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $9,000. And that considers that uh, workers' comp would pay about 66% uh, of his salary, and, and we could use that money, which is budgeted currently, to offset the cost of overtime. But one week of overtime at, at an average overtime rate is over $800. Uh, he makes $500 a week, roughly. Uh, that's an incredible amount of money, and it would certainly gobble up that 7000 bucks pretty quickly, I think. We would pay overtime to replace every shift that is left vacant due to an officer leaving the department. Uh, it takes a minimum of 14 weeks to hire a replacement officer, and we can say, well, what's the likelihood of that happening in this economy? Uh, I can tell you that if you look at our hiring statistics, we replace one officer a year, and you can set your watch by it. 
Some years we replace two, some years we replace none, but it averages out to an officer a year. Uh, I'll remind you that we're going through a promotional process now. Uh, we have five people that are going for two promotions, which means that we're going to have three people that do not make it. I have promoted uh, two individuals, in, uh, excuse me, three individuals in the last 12 years. Mobility in this department is not great. Uh, and whether or not one of those people uh, gets frustrated because <coughs> they expect it would be some point in, uh, down the road where they would uh, have an opportunity to be promoted and elect to go elsewhere, I don't know. I can't, I can't guarantee that. Uh, but I can tell you that if that's the case and we've got to fill uh, 14 weeks of overtime, that will cost us, for those 70 shifts, $11,200. We've got no latitude in this in terms of these people. Uh, if, if these eventualities should come to pass, I've got no one to look to to fill these shifts. Now, I'll tell you that if everything, uh, you know, is as we predict it, uh, if we don't have extended sick leave, if we don't have any officers leaving, and if we don't have extended uh, investigations, I can bring this budget in next year in the black. If we do, I can't guarantee that that's going to be the case, and I may very well uh, be coming back. In fact, my last point is that uh, to, to bring this budget into black into, as is projected, and that is to eliminate one officer's position and use the detective as a part-time position, uh, I had to come up with a mandate that required officers to take their vacation time during day shifts, and that would be effective July 1. Folks, these guys work Christmas, they work Thanksgiving, they work July, July 4th, they work during Hurricane Gloria, and I think one benefit that we should afford them is to, for them to take a vacation when it's convenient for them. And I've had to uh, tell them they couldn't do that this coming year. Now, there is a potential that they may make a legal argument uh, that will prohibit me from doing that, I feel confident that we can prevail on that. However, if we do not, uh, I would expect to come back and say I need monies to cover another 40 shifts. We have 277 overtime shifts scheduled for next year. The figure that you see reflected in the budget uh, suggests that we're only going to be filling about 130 of those. So if that's the case, uh, that figure alone would add another $6,500 to this budget. I just can't predict how, how that would come out. So I think financially, we've got to consider all these, these potentials. Uh, and they may very well pale in the face of, of what it would cost us uh, to refund this position. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. I would suggest at this point, if there's uh, you know, need for clarification uh, from anyone about this issue, why don't we just you know, try to uh, address it at this point uh, rather than keep coming back to it, and then we'll, we'll follow through the rest of the budget. But I think to make a decision one way or another, we probably ought to put this at the top of our uh, balance sheets and then make a decision at the end of the day once we have all of the requests for cha major changes in the budget, uh, unless someone has a different idea. I just want to say, Wayne, I may not be able to make that kind of decision today, I think. That's being very generous with our time, especially at the end of the day. And I, for one, probably want to revisit that in the entire list, yes. but not make that decision today. I don't want him going out here thinking he'll come back at the end of the day sure. here one way or the other. Thank you, Janet. I think that's a good point. We, we typically will revisit a variety of issues uh, today, so I hope that no one is upset or disappointed that when they're, they're leaving their, their uh, formal presentation that they don't have a decision. However, are there any clarifications about this issue? I just wanted to ask the Chief about the Kennel Code Patrol. Are you fulfilling the program for three years? Uh, two or three, yeah. I'm hoping that a regular police patrol will be able to handle it. One thing we won't be able to do <coughs> is have someone dedicated to that, that entrance where people go down on the beach, which is one of the reasons why the position was created in the first place. Uh, last year, we seemed to have less activity than the year before. I'm not, not sure why, but uh, I assume that uh, having a presence there or, or people knowing that someone was going to be checking impacted on the amount of people that use the beach. Uh, hopefully, we can control that through, through licensing, through registration at the police station. Uh, and issuing permits and just increasing our patrols down there. 
Um, if that should become a problem, then I would uh, probably pull a person out of patrol to put down there for a week or two until we could straighten things back out again. But I don't think in the long term we need to dedicate uh, on our, in the face of this, you know, this type of financial situation, we need to dedicate it. Another point in the, the cattle code detail. There seems to be a lot of confusion in the community that what's being proposed to be eliminated is some sort of patrol that goes on in the evening to, to try to write out, write out the kids or whoever else happens That's to be down point. there. This particular patrol is was the daytime patrol to try to keep vehicles off the beaches. It was the one that was set up a few years ago at the recommendation of the, the Harbor Advisory Committee. It was extremely effective. We worked very well with the state park system with, with some help from them. Uh, the, the thinking in eliminating it is that uh, with now with the signage and, and with the, the patrol mechanisms we have had, people have now adapted to, to know what it is that they're supposed to do and, and not supposed to do. And we also have more cooperation now from the state parks than, than I think we had in the past. So again, you know, it's something we really would prefer not to eliminate, but uh, in this budget it, it's something we looked at and said, do we really have to do this? And, we thought we'd take a chance and see how it works out. <coughs> what kind of services, if any, do we get through the Common County Sheriff's Department? None. Jail. Uh, Other than jail services. I assume you mean investigative services or anything like that. Is there anything available that we're not using that we could be using? No. Uh, by law, we have to have the uh, the state police investigate all homicides. So, you know, if we if we should have a homicide, they would come in and uh, pick up the investigation. Although they always assign a local officer <coughs> with them to assist. Um, I know of no community in Cumberland County that that has an organized department that uh, relies on uh, the sher either the sheriff's department or the state police uh, for investigative services. Uh, there's really none available, and of course, they have responsibilities through uh, road deputies in other communities uh, in Cumberland County that do not have uh, police agencies. We work closely with them, but uh, as far as being able to rely on them to, uh, to investigate crimes, we don't. I, don't. I don't know how many communities it does. I <clears throat> just want to say I agree with Jen, and I think this is going to be reviewed at the end of it when they settle down. And I would just like to ask, as far as I understand the chief that he gave us, you might say the figures for the, you might say the worst scenario of what could happen for the coming year. The figures for? As far as the budget goes, as far as the dollars and cents, the, the way I figured it out here. If we got if you have an investigation is going to be there New Year's Eve, and you had a couple of them a year, which I hope we may have another one. You're going to use up all your budget and you want some more money. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's really the way I got the drift in your presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's all I do. Okay, why don't we. While we're on this item, this doesn't directly relate to the position we've been discussing, but while we're on this account item, I have some questions for you. In your fiscal 1990 summer, you talk about some incorrect charge-offs mm -hmm. from overtime holiday and kind of COVID time, therefore showing a deficit in this full-time account. I see a deficit of over $17,000. Mm -hmm. Don't. I need to have you help me understand where those incorrect charge offs are because I don't see those those aren't adding up on those other three to come to the seventeen thousand. Those aren't all from incorrect charge offs. In my addendum that uh, you should have gotten your packet last night, it said that we underfunded a position. And basically that's what happened. Uh, underfunded a position last year. Uh, the confusion comes sometimes as we're going through these budgets in, in that because we have twenty four hour coverage uh, sometimes when people go on vacation or holidays or what have you, it's charged off to that particular account when it should be charged off to another. Uh, so as opposed to other departments that have a you know a standard payroll every single week, mine fluctuates from week to week because we can't just have somebody on vacation and not fill it. There's always got to be overtime uh, if there's a vacancy created for whatever reason, whether that person's in, at training, uh, on a holiday, or on vacation, or what have you. So it tends to sometimes we get confused between, between accounts. But the lion's share of that is because we underfunded the position. Okay. But, and 
on the, on the, the going through the information and underfunding, I found it was off about a thousand dollars. I'm really concerned about this. Well, here's a thousand dollars here, maybe there's a thousand dollars to five hundred mm -hmm. somewhere else, and it all adds up. And I'm very concerned about some of what it just doesn't jive the way yeah. I've gone through this. And I'm very upset <coughs> about it. And I hope next year to see from your department that I'm here, even if I'm not here, I hope whoever is here will see that the numbers jive. The, the, the numbers probably never will jive, jive and, and because uh, we have to have other contingency monies in there. If we have somebody that left the department today, uh, we would take that salary and use it to apply toward overtime to fill that position. Uh, because we're paying uh, a time and a half, that's not going to make up the difference, right, for that, for that vacancy. So what we do is we plug in uh, in fact, uh, in better times, better financial times, I had uh, 1500 or $2,000 that we could rely on in that particular account uh, to make up that, that difference. Uh, next year, I've got $500 in that account to make up that difference. So it, it's not something that can be terribly uh, accurately predicted. Uh, I wish it would. We have made some, uh, some progress and some adjustments to, to try to impact on that. And the first thing we did was we, uh, you also got to remember that by contract, we've got a lot of things that change throughout the year. We have people that, that get step increases. We have people that have 10-year longevity increases. We have people that begin to uh, be paid a community service step because they never did before because they, they have passed their EMT classes. Uh, we've got people who salary increases because they complete uh, college education. All of this is going to impact and fluctuate throughout this budget. Uh, all year. Uh, what we did this year was we took a worst case scenario of every officer. If this officer, you know, uh, satisfies requirements for college and uh, he gets paid this much more, uh, if he is going to be, uh, uh, experience a step increase at the end of the year, we began to, you know, we assume we're going to be charging from the first of the year. So uh, we, we know that if, if that is the only thing that's going to impact that particular account, we're going to come out in the black. What we don't know is the other overtime that's going to impact upon it. Uh, court time, what have you, all those particular accounts uh, have some impact, which, you know, we try to predict from year to year. It's just real, real difficult. But, uh, you know, that, that one uh, mistake that we made should not happen again. And, uh, you know, we've, we've taken measures to ensure that it does not. As far as being able to say this account's going to cost us $260,000 a penny, I can't do that. I don't need you to talk to the penny. Yeah, I need or, you to, or to the to the dollar, whatever. Closer than a thousand. Closer than a thousand. Okay, why don't we continue on through here? Do you want me to take time with each account, Mr. Chairman? If it's if if we see a reduction in, a, in an account, do you want to skip over that? I, I would hope that maybe as we get through, they explain the changes. Why don't we highlight, yeah, any major changes if it's uh, obviously okay. identical to last year. I'm not terribly interested uh, in going into great detail under those circumstances. And okay. we'll just keep it, you know, relatively informal. And if people have questions as you're going along, we'll All right. respectfully interrupt. I'm going to uh, skip over part-time payroll. Uh, and overtime, although I would say on, on the overtime account, 210-1003, uh, that we have come to that number by reducing the amount of staff meetings that we have. Uh, that's one impact on the budget. Uh, vacations and holidays, as I have already mentioned, is something that's an extremely volatile uh, account. And it's really going to depend on how successful I am at being able to uh, um, put these people, or let them, make them take their vacation during the day shift as to whether or not that number is going to stay that way. I need to go back to part time. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I have a clear understanding on this that the school crossing guard is proposed for a 5% increase. Yes. Okay. Which uh, that is not. Change that we no. just received. Yeah. There are a couple of the part time stipends that, when I was reviewing the budget further, I noticed that they weren't being, being adjusted like the others, and okay. it does show on your part time stipend. Mm -hmm. Right. 
uh, if they elect so elect to do that the beginning of each year they can save those 12 holidays and take them as vacation time in the next year uh, which is something again which contributes to the confusion on budgeting for salaries uh, because it would be possible you know we've got to assume that those monies are are, uh, uh, are a liability an unfunded liability and if these officers you know they, they've got to elect to take these particular vacation days or holidays in the beginning of the year but if they did you know those are other those are other shifts that we're going to have to fill Well, there's, there's sev <laughs> several, several things in municipal government that uh, are through, through contract uh, negotiations that we have had for years, and it's been a legacy which has been difficult to, uh, to budget for that until we are successful in negotiating them out of the contract, we're obligated to. Vacation time. Yeah, they've got to they've got to elect to take these holidays the first part of the year, uh, for instance now. But you know that's going to go into the next uh, fiscal year. Well, we have two sets of holidays. The people that that elect to save them uh, would have to tell us that. Of course, they don't tell us when they're going to take their holidays. Uh, each individual officer gets 12 days a year, and they can take those, you know, throughout the year. These 60 days that have been that have accrued, uh, again, are a liability that we we have to concern ourselves with uh, for, for only three or four officers that 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 save them. Yes. So you don't have to figure it in this budget, and then they don't have to like to do it. No, only only in terms of a liability. Where, where that might impact is if they left the department, uh, we would go to Mike for for that severance money. Uh, for instance, uh, had Captain Tolan uh, had that time accrued, we would owe him that time. So, uh, in in terms of that as a liability, it was the reason why I put that down there. Uh, the 277 vacation days, the one that we expect to fill, and this is for the police department only. This does not consider uh, the dispatch's time. Thank you. <coughs> Sick relief payroll, I've, in, I've increased a little bit just to account for around the 5% uh, contracted pay increase. Uh, Training replacement, we've increased a little bit. And I, it, probably in the one of the addendums that uh, you received, perhaps early on in the process, I made a comparison of program costs. Uh, and EMT is one that, that I looked at quite carefully. Uh, I think it's important to note that that EMT program costs us about $21,000 a year right now. That is in uh, benefits, uh, excuse me, that, that's in pay, what the officers receive and pay for that, as well as uh, the cost of training officers throughout the year. And maintaining their EMT certification. Is it day -day no, I'm not. And how many hours of overtime do you generally use to cover that training? That is going to training? Initial training uh, is well. It's, it can be over a hundred, of course. Uh, if we have that officer to fill that, that kind of time, we can we can put them on a three to eleven shift. So uh, that's generally when the EMT courses take place. Uh, and they will cover that, so we don't have replacement costs. Uh, and again, you know, that's, that's kind of tough to predict. If, if we can put somebody in that position, we wouldn't have the replacement cost. If we can't, we could pay up to uh, over 100 hours. That's what the, uh, the basic EMT course is. It's over 100 hours now. And the refresher is, uh, I think, uh, 30, something like that, which it takes place every three years. There is, by the way, a move afoot, I understand, through EMS to expand uh, that certification time. It used to be yearly, which was which quite restrictive, uh, difficult for people to, to maintain. They've expanded to three years, and rumor is that they may go to four or five, so that might help us out a little bit. Who makes that decision? Uh, 
emergency medical services. The, uh, the, the EMS is the, and Augusta is the one that, that uh, monitors that program. Jan, and I'm not sure if we would want to push to extend that out too far because I think there's a real benefit to municipalities for having occasional refreshers in three years. It's not really all that long, particularly when you consider some of the changes in technology. <coughs> I'd be a little bit hesitant to, to try to extend something that uh, really might be in our best interest to, to have the refresher as well as the people who serve. We've already touched on investigative overtime uh, with the detective's position. Uh, court time is something else that's very difficult to predict, and that's you know, just kind of a guess as to what we've had over the last couple of years. Uh, do we have any sense with the new district attorney's uh, change and all how that's going to affect that account? My sense is that we are going to be using more court time. More uh, court she court certainly court. is more aggressive prosecutorially than what we have experienced in the last few years. Uh, special assignments, again, has it's kind of an account that has offsetting revenue. This is just to allow us to bill out special jobs and things of that nature. Kettle Cove, uh, again, has been uh, uh, eliminated for the upcoming fiscal year. Are you proposing to have the Kettle Cove detail this fiscal year? Uh, yeah, we will have uh, officers assigned to that. I'm not sure if we're going to spend as much time uh, as we did before. It never, it, it don't, doesn't take place until June anyway, so we've got about a four-week window. I was asking um, because it's not been projected for expenditures. If that'll be through our regular patrol officers, we'll have somebody down there. There won't be a, an officer assigned. Wouldn't be. We won't be going out and hiring an officer for that uh, one month period. No. So you're not spending the 5,400. Right. Okay. Right. We will use uh, regular officers in that. Where's in that, that 5,400 in your fiscal year this year? Where is that 5,400? That that applies to bottom line. Yes. No, that well, if you did, did you get the budget worksheet, the, the initial worksheet? Uh, it shows what the projected balance is for FY91. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that I, I would intend to put back $5,410, so that affects the bottom line. Uh, at the end of this, this fiscal budget year, I'm projecting a surplus of $6,230. That's for all three accounts that's for police, uh, animal control, and dispatches. So that figure would contribute to that surplus that we have in those accounts. That in. That's right. It's been factored in, as I say. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I would like to mention, if you look at all of these projections, that these were done in January, and uh, a lot of things may happen between January and June. So I, I wouldn't take any of these projections to be sacred. Printing and advertising uh, hasn't changed from last year's appropriation. Uh, dues and membership has not. Training we've reduced, and again, that's something that, uh, that I know Mike had, uh, had talked to me about several times. Uh, the fact of the matter is we've got to have a certain amount of minimum training, and that's, that I think reflects directly on uh, the liability that we accept uh, and protecting ourselves from any kind of civil action and simply being able to do uh, the job. So. Another important factor is that we have several offices that are continuing their post-secondary education, uh, which we provide for by contract. We've got to provide monies uh, for those individuals. Uh, Dave, that uh, yes, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not comfortable. I'm not happy to see that you are not taking a reimbursement. Well, it's uh, it's just not necessary. I, I'd prefer that. Uh, uh, the budget wind up the way it was, and I can get it next next year. It's not not a, not a problem. <coughs> yes. Yes. Uh, can we? No. Unless we change the contract. That's uh, in the contract to see or better. I will say historically that we get grades higher than C. Yeah. yeah. I, in fact, I don't think uh, I don't think I've seen. Has a <laughs> question that they really weren't interested in. Yeah. Report writing. Uh, conferences and meetings has all but uh, eliminated. In fact, I had eliminated it. Mike gave me back two hundred dollars so I can buy a soda or something at the next conferences and meetings. So. Uh, before we continue, mm -hmm. is there a policy to have this 
budget of uh, not attending any other state conferences or something. I didn't see any money anyway. In, in very few areas, there are, there are funds for out of state conferences, and when we get to those, I'll address them. But basically, there are no funds for out of state conferences. There are, there's, there's one that someone's doing that's the third year of three year program that I made an exception for. Uh, there's also a the small amount of the council account uh, remaining. But aside from that, to my recollection, that's it. But we are going to take advantage of statewide conferences. Uh, vehicle maintenance is an account which which I would expect would be impacted if we refunded the uh, detectives position in my addendum I suggest putting another <coughs> excuse me fifteen hundred dollars toward that account if we do that uh, the number you see reflected in front of you suggests that we trade uh, two cruises uh, next year and, and assuming that we're gonna have two new cars we, we expect our maintenance cost to be a little bit lower obviously if we keep one or two of those cars for a couple of years we're going to be running uh, in excess of uh, probably by the end of the second year uh, 220, 230,000 miles. Chief, do our replacement of cruisers uh, coincide with, how should I say, the, uh, the county norm with other municipalities yeah. in terms of the mileage and that sort of thing? Yeah, there's been a couple of uh, communities that have experimented with uh, trading cars uh, every two years, every three years. Uh, and they tell me that, that we can expect uh, a dramatic increase in maintenance costs uh, in that second year. So historically, departments trade their cars yearly. One thing that uh, our, our vehicles always have 100,000 miles, and because of the design of the patrol here, I mean, you have uh, perhaps more road miles per car than other communities, is that we run more mileage than most towns do, uh, in excess of 100,000. I know South Poland trades their cars with between 60 and 75,000. So they do, you know, enjoy a much greater trade-in value than we do, just by the sheer fact that we don't have, uh, uh, they have uh, less miles than we do. And we still continue to use the COG contracts? Yes, we do. possible price for replacement? Uh, yes, we do. Um, at one point, I think it was <coughs> beneficial for us to use COG. They charge us $250 per car uh, to bid them, so we can take $500 off the savings. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen a number of municipalities, not a number, but of certain municipalities who are not involved in COG coattailing co the state bid. So what you end up is a car that is as cheap as we can get through COG to the state bid, uh, and not only do they, they don't have to pay subscriber fees, but they don't have to pay to bid those cars out either the bid fees. So uh, if you're asking me if I could come back next year without going through COG and buy cars as cheap, I would say yes. Chief sure. and I have had a, uh, a very preliminary discussion on this topic and my strong leanings is still toward participating in the COG bid, <coughs> uh, but a definite decision has not been made for this coming year. But I do strongly lean toward continuing the COG bid. So in particular, for example, South Portland is not a member of COG. Do you know for a fact that their cruisers cost more or less than ours for replacement? I know they cost less, but you've got to remember that they replace seven cars, too, so they may be able to make a, an impact because of volume. And do they do a private deal or the coattails to state police? They coattail state police bid this year. Yeah, through another vendor, too. Uh, it wasn't a local vendor, which I think has some benefits. Uh, <coughs> COG always tries to get a local vendor. Uh, they may be buying through Walker Chevrolet or something out of town, which sometimes makes makes service difficult. Radio maintenance, I've increased a little bit. Uh, the radios we have now are, are getting old, and I predict that they're going to be a little bit more of a maintenance headache next year. <coughs> Contractual services uh, remains the same. Again, this is another account which would be uh, I would recommend increasing by $1,000 if, uh, if we retain the, the full-time position. Uh, and uh, that would mean, that, that would uh, attempt to, to impact uh, the effect of losing the utility position or reducing the utility position to part-time. What would you see being contracted after that long utility position? Uh, we would have things like uh, crews of washes. Right now the utility officer washes the cruises and does routine, you know, little maintenance things. We do things around the uh, the station as well. 
uh, you know, minor repairs, that kind of thing. As I understood this budget, Chief, we, we we're already planning to wash the cars outside anyway. It is one of the local car washes that one's helpful and has a real good deal for yeah, like the, an annual amount for a vehicle. Right now, they're hundred. Right now, it's a hundred dollars per vehicle. Per per yeah, per vehicle. But for what period of time? Uh, for a year. Yeah. yeah. When, when I look at that versus the amount of time we're spending on a utility person do this, I strongly encourage the chief to explain to me that this budget does provide for that. So right. Get more productivity out of the utility office. Right. The time that is spent washing cars. But if we needed a lock repaired, or <coughs> <coughs> needed a you know a light replace some some uh, minor maintenance or, or minor service at the uh, at the public safety building that the officer does that now uh, that is just to pick up the slack if that position wasn't available to do that. You'd have to have somebody from the outside come in and fix the light. Well, whatever. If if it's an electrical service or something like that, I would just certainly wouldn't feel you know, qualified to do it. We don't have unlicensed people handle electrical. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Things because of obvious reasons. And the utility person is licensed. No. This is, this, uh, no, he yeah. can change the light bulb. But oh, if sure. there's electrical work to be done, oh, sure. you have to have someone licensed to do it that codes do not allow. Let's let's say we we, had, we, you know, we wanted to paint out a room or we wanted to, you know, have the have the uh, uh, rugs cleaned or anything like that. Those kinds of things we would contract out if that person was not available to do that. I think the question is, how many police officers does it take to change a license? <laughs> 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 Mr. Bell, when public works, is who's licensed to be able to do electrical works? No. With all their equipment? No. We don't, I, I, I think a, a bigger deal is being made over this than perhaps it should be. Yeah, I'm a little taken back by myself. If you look on electrical during the year, it's, it doesn't amount to very much. Uh, very little. What's the E2 station? Engine, engine 2. Uh, is that $100 a year for a car and you wash twice a week or once a week? Uh, I don't think there's a limit on the washes. There isn't. You keep your car out of it. <laughs> I think it is, yeah. <laughs> and they don't use recycled water either, Bill. No. Okay. Office of supplies. That's increased only slightly in anticipation that the expenses are going to increase as well. Uh, gasoline, we've increased uh, a little bit. I really think that we're getting as many. Uh, miles per gallon as we can on the cars and we're, we're uh, patrolling as efficiently as possible. Uh, uniform account we've reduced <coughs> to only that which is guaranteed by contract at $225 per year. Uh, minor equipment and tool account uh, has been reduced. I think it's important to note that uh, this particular account does include approximately 1500 for uh, DR supplies and materials. That's the, uh, the drug course which we have at the fifth grade level. Uh, we do accept a fair amount of donations for that and we may very well have offsetting revenues to take care of that. Uh, I just don't dare you know, count on it so that, that money uh, might be available at the end of the budget. Uh, we've got some very generous benefactors and uh, civic organizations in town that routinely uh, give to this effort. But I'm not sure how, what's going to happen next year. That's why I put Outlay, as you can see, uh, includes presently two vehicles. I would reduce that, that figure to $13,350. Uh, I assume Mike made the adjustment on that. To 20, is it 26-1? Okay. That would be adjusted to 13350 if the uh, detective's position is retained. You uh, the light bars are getting another yellow And the white, yeah, the light bars have been cut for, uh, is this the third year, I think? We continue to apologize, Chief, on this noted uh, the wet team uh, we, we expected that this account would be reduced this year anyway as you recall last year we had uh, relatively large expenditure for uh, pagers uh, radios and the like and we were able to uh, make those purchases or make those procurements uh, so this is a figure that we pretty much would expect to come in with anyway $1,500 figure uh, 
purchases uh, replacement items, flashlights, batteries, that kind of thing. Animal control, uh, the account 215-1002 uh, expects a 5% increase in, in uh, that officer's base salary, and again, that assumes that that position is retained. Uh, if the detective position is replaced, this would be cut back to uh, uh, 16 hours per week. Uniform account, again, does not change. Miscellaneous supplies does not change. Uh, one account that I, I guess I've got to say I'm a little incensed about is the account on the Animal Refuge League. We've had to come up with $4,500. Uh, and I would strongly suggest that the council uh, give uh, me some direction and attempt to find some other avenue to store these animals. You, you have that direction. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. To uh, try to figure out any other way than our being held hostage uh, by this particular account, so to speak. We've made some, uh, or I should say, it would, it would be Mike's responsibility to direct me in that effort. And we have made some preliminary efforts toward uh, uh, getting a local person to do that. We got some, some uh, uh, ordinance concerns we would have to look into. Uh, but I do think we should, we should attempt to, to find some other alternative for that. Chief, it's difficult uh, to, to discuss the, the qualitative uh, and morale sort of issues when you're always looking at bottom line numbers. But do you have any sense as to uh, how things will change if the utility person's uh, time is basically cut in half to attend to animal control? Well, we've got a couple of restrictions. I, I don't, we don't allow animals, uh, with the exception of Buster, who was, who was a you know, vehicle that's designed for that purpose, we don't just carry strays in the cruisers, uh, you know, because we carry people in them. So I, I guess that would be the biggest problem that we would have. Uh, and having the officers perform, perform those services is to transport animals. Uh, as far as handling the complaints, I don't expect it would be a, a great problem. That's why I think we could probably, right now we've got 16 hours a week dedicated to canine, uh, our animal control alone. Uh, we would reduce that by half and those eight hours would be used uh, primarily to respond to complaints. Uh, there wouldn't be a lot of patrol. Uh, but if we saw a particular time of day, a particular day of the week where we're getting a lot of complaints, uh, then we could channel that person's activities in that direction to try to impact on that. But in terms of complaints, I, I don't see it be a. I mean, a big it does problem. seem to me, you know, just every once in a while trying to keep abreast of the, uh, you know, the violations that are printed mm -hmm. in the local newspaper. <coughs> it seems like people in Cape Elizabeth are, you know, reasonably responsible with regard to the whole issue of dog control. I mean, I don't see. Yep. It's improved a great deal. It's improved a great deal. Uh, but I can tell you that, that, that dog complaints are one of the most troublesome complaints that we get into, and you can appreciate that probably. <laughs> so it's another one of those issues, and you know, I think we were discussing earlier the kind of <coughs> daytime patrol issue. Uh, you know, you do away with that, we're taking the risk that we're going to have problems down there again. Similarly, if the animal control officer is reduced X number of hours, that sends the message out, uh, well, I can take more chances with my dog. That's that's uh, that's what happens. Well, let all who are watching know that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> Including the residents of Kettle Cove, uh, there will continue to be patrols and especially the residents. Especially Kettle that's Cove. Right. Do they nip at your heels, Larry? Uh, no comment. Uh, we we'll move on to the uh, the two twenty accounts, dispatching accounts. Uh, Full-time account, of course, assumes a, a similar staffing level as last year. It does uh, increase that by 5% for contract pay increases. Uh, Part-time costs do not change. Holiday replacement, again, considers a 5% increase. Uh, vacation pay, we reduced uh, a little bit in anticipation of, of, a, of a surplus in that account. Sick leave. Uh, Again, it, it's unpredictable. We, we ran about uh, three or four years of the surplus in this account. Uh, we've got uh, w one dispatcher that uh, had an, ex or, or I guess two dispatchers who had an uh, extended sick leave uh, due to family illnesses or personal illnesses. And we're going to, you know, uh, anticipate a deficit in that account. It's something that you just can't predict. And whereas in other departments we can just run them light, we cannot in police services. We've got to have somebody <coughs> cover those shifts. 
and at $160 a pop, it doesn't take long to make $1,000. It doesn't take many shifts. Yes. It shouldn't be unless it was a typo. Should be. No, no, it's two, it's two things. One is the computer rounding. Oh, that's Mike Sheet. <laughs> I don't know about Mike Sheet. It must have come in at five point five. The, the second thing is is that uh, there's also a provision in the police contract whereby in the second year of the agreement it is five percent plus three dollars or something like that. That was part of the agreement. Uh, there was an additional, I think, ten dollars over three years right. that was put in. So that's uh, that plus people going up through the steps. For I think it's probably one. Is there still one in dispatcher? There's, there's two in dispatcher. That are going up through the steps. Just as long as you realize that really the contract is five percent, that's really what's going on. Yeah. Right. To, to my knowledge, every single uh, position. In this budget, is proposed to increase full-time position is proposed to increase five percent. Uh, the only exception is there is one in public works that is being proposed to be moved from an hourly position to a salary position. So it shows it going up more than five percent, but it's still you know, it, it's a it's a change in, in the way it's being done. But other than that, you know the the pay classification plan, every single position is due to go five percent. There are a couple people. Going up the steps within it. Okay, so on all your summary sheets, these are rounding up at least half a percent higher than what's actually happening. Not having reviewed every summary sheet, I wouldn't want to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, it it all six percent, seven percent. Yeah, it, constantly. yeah, that's essentially because of people, a few folks going up the steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. The telephone account uh, remains unchanged for next year as the miscellaneous supplies and uniform account. I think that's pretty much it other than the, the addendums, which I, I assume you've, uh, you've read on your own anyway, and I won't take up time to do that. Uh, I did provide the general in impacts that these cuts and changes are going to make, <coughs> both increase and decrease uh, the budget on all three of these uh, services, police services, animal control, and dispatch. Uh, I've also included a, a list of potential uh, revenue generators, which I don't know if it's included in the budget or not, as well as a memorandum on program costs. I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have about those. One, uh, when we're going to get to the revenues this afternoon. When you get to the police, you notice I have proposed an increase. I, we haven't resolved fully where, where that's going to come from, but it essentially we're looking at that in mind. Suggestion is uh, the registration fee. Is, it's already provided for in the ordinance. It's more enforcement and collection of it uh, than it is uh, actually having to come the new revenue. Any clarifications needed for the addendum? Secretary, thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Chief Webster, welcome. Chief Webster, would you uh, please the uh, deputy chiefs? Mr. Murray, are you going to join your chief? I'm sitting right here. Yeah, we can. Right. You all deputy know uh, Deputy Gleason. Welcome. It is Mr. Gleason. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Peter and Don here. Uh, Don has been out with a medical problem all week and really appreciate his coming in today uh, to uh, represent uh, the fire department budget. Uh, as you can see, it, it's another budget that uh, is feeling the restraints of, of uh, the budget, the overall budget this year. And, uh, uh, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job representing um, the needs of the fire department, although there, there are a number of disappointments, and I think chief among them is the fact that a replacement fire truck uh, isn't, isn't budgeted. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Webster uh, to highlight the budget for the field board. Thank you. Uh, just uh, 
like every other department, we spent many, many hours going over this, especially uh, with the Board of, Board of Engineers. And I would like to thank them all for their, uh, for their input uh, into this budget. Excuse me, Chief White, so maybe we'll just take a break for a moment since uh, there are... I can hear. Uh, maybe just, just for a moment so we can get some of the crew back here and we don't want to have to repeat anything twice. Please. Thank you. Uh, I think as this year as in past years, uh, you'll find there's no frills in this budget. I, I think basically this is just going to keep the fire department basically as a viable unit for another year. That's all. Uh, we've, we've tried. Uh, there's, there are many things that, uh, for one thing, Mike mentioned the, the fire truck. It's got to be replaced sometime. We've got to do some work to engine one's building. Uh, we got our estimate this year of $7,500, but we've put it off, but it's every year you put it off, it's going to cost more, and the buildings in the, at the same time is going to deteriorate to some extent. So with that, I don't know, do you have anything to add to that, Peter? Um, I think the only thing that you have to remember is that we are the only volunteer organization in the town providing a municipal service, and we do, we ask only for what we believe is reasonable. We don't ask for anything extravagant, and in deferring the fire truck, we understand the budgetary constraints and, and wishing to keep within a five percent increase so that that is not something we cannot live with uh, we realize that when the time comes we are desperate for the apparatus we will get it so that's what we've as a unit we've traditionally asked for only what we feel we need the basics we don't ask for anything fancy just want, when you go through that just remember that it, it also remains consoling to know that there, there seems to be such extraordinary cooperation between our department and, and neighboring departments that, that in an emergency, in a pinch, the cross coverage seems to continue to be uh, really most gratifying. Well, on that issue, I think we've got to be a little bit careful. Some folks misunderstand mutual aid as the other community always coming to your aid. Uh, they've had a number of problems elsewhere in the state with this and mutual aid means we also have to keep up a certain level so that we're ready to go to them and you know we can't get into the situation and i'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we're heading in that direction we're going to be very careful three five years down the road that, that we not look to well south portland and uh, scarborough can provide this and that and uh, we're not providing much of anything you know, we have to hold up our share of it you know, I've, I've heard some comments that you know, we don't need this piece of equipment, we don't need that. And you know, obviously, we could look at some joint arrangements for pieces of equipment, but still, we can't keep deferring everything because we, we have got to do our share of the mutual aid. And uh, I, I don't think that ought to be forgotten. Please. Thank you. Would you like to uh, go through each item, or would you like me to carry the? Or yeah, would you? my thought is that. Uh, any items that certainly haven't changed from last year, I, I don't think we need to pay much attention to those. Uh, and your full-time payroll is self-explanatory. So perhaps really beginning with the training. Okay. Uh, Part-time payroll, there was no increase in that. Uh, just they, they did receive an increase across the board last year. And I would like to say that for the $24,000, we can put 100 people on the street about any time of the day in any emergency. That's a pretty good, pretty good bargain uh, for, for the town. Uh, training. You, would you like to skip all the way to training? There uh, haven't been any major changes. Dues and memberships, no. Training. Uh, uh, we, uh, we like to send two men to Maryland every year. It's kind of a little perk. They go down, get some, get some terrific training, come back, pass it on to us. So there's really been... Uh, very little, very little, there's like an $80 increase in that. For those, the total cost of that is only $300 per person that goes up, even though it's not geographically located uh, in Maine, and it's the equivalent cost of something that would be in state. So it's, it's a real big Yeah, deal. the state shares the cost. We pay the, basically the transportation cost, basically. So, and it's a, it's a state of Maine weekend 
all the state of Maine, it's all state of Maine people down there that weekend. So, Chief, why was that not originally in your budget? Uh, that was one of the things that uh, we cut to try and get down as low as we could go. And it's been reinstated. It has been reinstated after talk speaking with the town manager. When it happened, I had given the chief a certain target, and you know, as you all know from discussions I've had with you, as well as from the quarter and otherwise, that you know the major issue was whether or not we were going to keep the full time position. Uh, after meeting with uh, the volunteers and recognizing <coughs> the value of the position, uh, I reinstated it. But what happened is, in an effort to try to save that position, some things have been proposed for cuts that I felt really ought not to be cut, uh, some things that particularly involving the volunteers. So when, uh, after I met with the, the volunteers and with the chief, the, uh, the deputies who were present, and others, uh, what I tried to do was to make things whole as much as possible, and particularly to concentrate, as I had said I would, on uh, giving the volunteers the things that they need to be good volunteers, the tools to work with. I, I think, you know, when you've got groups provide with someone providing $24,000, $25,000, $25,000 worth of labor, a million dollars worth of labor, you ought to spend the few thousand dollars here and there to, to support them. I'm also curious, Mr. Count, about the increase in the materials line from $500 to $1,000. That cut reinstatement of yeah, the level. Yeah, that was what we put in every year is a thousand. But that was another item we had cut. We had cut it in half, uh, trying to cut down on some of the training materials. So in general, Chief, all of the tight figures in your budget were tight prior to the uh, the issue being resolved about the full time permanent position. Yes. The the written in our reinstatements based on your discussions with the town manager as a final budget. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, conferences and meetings, uh, like everybody else, we've eliminated the out-of-state uh, conferences. What is being covered? The in-state uh, in state conferences and uh, the most of the county, the deputies and I attend most of the county meetings. They'll pay for, pay for our meals and uh, such things as that. Vehicle maintenance, we had a decrease in that from last year because we had $8,900 in there last year for engine one body work. The only thing that we have put in there this year is the $1,500 for engine two. If we don't get at it, it's going to be much worse next year, I think. We're going to replace a couple of fenders on it. That's what the uh, body shop has recommended. Uh, other than that, it's just regular maintenance. The ladder testing is required by uh, uh, NFPA standards be tested once a year, especially the ladder truck that's 40 years old. Uh, I think it proved last year that it's well worth the money uh, to, to find the, the problems we had. Excuse me, I need to go back to the um, I'll ask you the same question I asked the police chief. Are you chief of EMT? No. Is there money in here for you to go through that training? No. I was an EMP for nine years in, in Portland. Would you do a Chief and I have had some discussions about that, and we have not resolved the discussions. A number of areas have been discussed throughout this whole budget process, but with the press of time and everything else, it hasn't been addressed. It's still being discussed, and no decisions. Uh, the the uh, radio fire alarm maintenance that covers the whole range of uh, maintaining 110 pages to the 30 uh, mobile units and portables we've got plus our fire alarm system uh, throughout the town in the municipal buildings, the schools, and uh, fire stations. How many pagers does each volunteer have? One. And Councilor George has certainly allowed us. Equipment maintenance, once again, that covers all of our, uh, whether we need a generator repair or, or a chainsaw repaired. We have in the budget, we budgeted for six uh, self-contained breathing apparatus retrofits this year. OSHA says you've got to run those through a test every three years. 
we found most of them have been done for years. Uh, so it, there, it's running from, we're averaging about $150 each to have these done, sent out. And <coughs> most of it is, is diaphragms, O-rings, stuff like that have dried out over the years. Uh, so we've, I think we're going to end up being able to do eight this year and the other six that we plan to do this coming year. Fuel is just a regular increase uh, of about what, five cents a gallon. I guess we went up five cents a gallon on that. The uniforms, uh, this is our standard 10%. We try and re uh, replace 10% of the, the coats, helmets, and gloves every year. The, what's the other gear? The other gear is if, say, we get someone that comes on the fire department, it needs to, they, have to, they all have to have a pair of boots and bunker pants, and no one takes the same size. So we have to send them out. We try, we've tried that before. Tried <laughs> to, because if you, buy, if you buy 10 sets of gears, obviously you get a price, and we never seem to have the right size of, of whoever joins, so we've gone to as they join, we buy it. And it costs you about two hundred twenty-five dollars for a set of boots, a set of bunker pants, and a pair of boots. Once in a while, you get a female. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with females, definitely. I didn't say that. I'm scared of females. And we usually run short on the gloves, by you know, people <coughs> lose a pair of gloves or they burn a pair of gloves, and th little things like that. We have to, we have to, uh, we have to keep some type of a stock over there. You know, if someone comes in on set, he says, "I need a pair of gloves." You have to have them there. So. As far as recognizing the volunteers, as Mike's proposing this, this is something that's very important to the personnel is, is to make sure they have the proper gear and being able to purchase what they want for gear reaps you uh, benefits that far outweigh the cost. I know a couple of years ago, we had a lot of bunker pants on, but we've gotten over the, yeah. that. I'm curious, in last year's, in the 91 fiscal budget, there was $1,400 for patches, hats, and jackets. I don't see that being addressed here. I'm wondering if there's an adequate supply or how the supply is coming up on those. Uh, what happened there, that was another case. We tried to recognize the volunteers. We we're going to buy them jackets with a little patch on them. And before the budget process was finalized, each company went out and bought their own. So they voted, let's forget it. And so what we did was bought two more. We voted to buy two more uh, bunker coats. But we do have uh, patches and, and hats. So, But the jackets, they went out, the companies went 50-50 with them. Uh, out of their own treasury and they bought some real nice jackets. I've seen the, yeah. yeah. I was aware that some things had been bought. I too am very concerned about the morale issue. I yeah. just want to make sure that. But that was the intent of it, just to, to buy them a, a, you know, a $20 jacket. and uh, But they ended up going out buying a $45 jacket with a company paying half. So. Minor equipment, uh, pages, we replace 10 pages a year. Uh, yeah. No, we replace them. We, we usually end up, get, between the loss and junking a uh, page or two, we usually end up getting rid of 80 a year, 8 or 9 a year. I think we lost two this year, and, and I think we probably jumped five anyway. That once we get to what we've paid for the page originally, we don't put any more money in. If we paid three hundred dollars and we put three hundred dollars into it, they say that's it. Don't put any more money into it. So uh, we, you know, ten percent is is a good good figure. We find tools is ju that's just regular hand tools, uh, saws, hammers, and stuff that we lose or, or damage in a fire. Miscellaneous supplies, uh, these are all our share of uh, the computer supplies, copy paper, and uh, and office supplies. And that's pretty much standard year after year. The one thing that uh, town managers added in there is, is this $2,500 for a vol volunteer recognition program, which the uh, the Board of Engineers is very excited about I think it's long overdue. Uh, you can pat these people on the back, thank them, but they'd like to have a little uh, recognition from the town, I think. And we had met with the captains and the deputies, and what they would like to do, their suggestion was, use this money to pay. We, once a year, we have a ladies' night. Uh, recognition, spouses' night. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, I know. Well, I think we're going to call it recognition night, but <laughs> you know, and this this way we can pay for the, the spouses half of the of the program of, of the meal. And another thing they'd like to do is have a quarterly award for someone who's done something, gone that extra step for the, for the department, whether it's fire or rescue or, or whatever. And give them a little plaque, have a plaque in the lobby, and give them a plaque for the home. May I ask Michael a question? <clears throat> we have all these different supplies that are purchased, computer supplies, various miscellaneous office supplies. Do we buy those as a town bulk price, the town hall supplies, as well as all the miscellaneous supplies? Most of it, we buy all of our paper supplies through the school department. They have a they have a bid that they do the card that they buy it by the pallet, which is X number of cases really a huge supply. Beyond that, uh, there is a, there's a car bid and there's a state bid, and Lauren Short and Common, I believe it now, is, gives us, it is Lauren Short, gives us 50% off the catalog for all consumables, and I think it's 20% off for furnishings and all those type things, so all papers, pens, legal pads, all those things, is 50% off. So as a town, you're saying yes, you do buy yeah. all those things for the police and the yeah. fire department. Basically. Yeah, but, but even then, you know, there's some outfit called Quill that, uh, that is, a, is a discount out, outlet, and this week they, we were looking, I forget what it is that, that we needed. So they were looking at the Quill catalog, and they found that that was less expensive. <coughs> so that they do, uh, not much gets by without finding the, the best price. Well, we don't buy toner from California. <laughs> One of the rules. <laughs> and I think we have special needs too. That, that East, whether it's the police department or fire department, we have special needs that we can't just can't buy town wide. Yeah, there's a lot of doing it's the bulk of it is done, and we also most of our printing is done through the school. Uh, we save quite a lot of money yeah. in, in the printing. Yeah. Move down here if you want, John. This is the other deputy chief, by the way, uh, deputy civil. Uh, fire prevention. Anybody have any questions on that account? Fire prevention. Fifteen hundred dollars, uh, uh, two thousand uh, dollars. That's pretty much spent. We we spend about eight hundred, between eight hundred and a thousand dollars on that one day of fire prevention for the schools. Our materials will run about eight hundred dollars. And everybody that donates their time for the day, we take them out to lunch. So a thousand dollars, pretty much uh, half of the budget spent right that one single day, and the rest is spent. Uh, we we have a learn not to burn program, which we're doing through the community services. We buy supplies for them, uh, little trinkets, balloons, things like that. They that they need stickers, and we spend three four hundred dollars a year on that. And we also hit all the nursery schools in town to end the day kids with this learn not to print through Peggy Fogg, uh, the coordinator. And the only other thing that we spend uh, is uh, on the f up to update the code books every year. We have a subscription. We subscribe to the NFPA. It's a loose leaf book. Anytime there's a change in the codes, we get it monthly. And that costs us $300 a year. Outlay. Uh, our standard hose replacement, uh, we replace 500 feet of 4 inch hose every year and uh, usually 200 feet of, of, tuna, of uh, 2 inch. We offer the hepatitis shots to the rescue people, or actually they're offered to everybody but usually the rescue people I don't want to take advantage of them. Our radio replacement, we try and spend $2,000 a year to update our radios. Uh, once again, we do the same with those. If we pay $500 for it, uh, we put $500 in and we junk it. And the other, the other item is the air packs. We've got one truck, the forestry truck down engine one, which they would very much like to have two air packs on it. That's the first truck into these places like Downo Park in the wintertime where we can't get, uh, or we're slow getting a you know, full-size apparatus in there. They would like to have two breathing apparatus on there so they can just get in the building, make a search, and, and get out. 
So this is just a cute ear connection, just very formative. Yes. And we have also found through this testing process, they've already found two that they recommend we get rid of in a year or so because they're just getting so old. And they've got to <laughs> be all right. The, the, the council, the rest of the buildings will probably have, you know, page 217. One thing, before we get off of the fire department, the south of the building, Deputy Chief Murray just had to go to the state fire marshal that arrived and went to meet with him. <coughs> the chief was unable to do it because he was, was there. But anyway, he wanted me to make mention for him that uh, <coughs> emphasizing, again, the rescue and the services they provide. And while we were talking about the amount that the, the part-time volunteers receive of 24000 all of that goes to the members of Engine 1 and Engine 2 companies. None of that goes to the members of the rescue. Uh, the rescue members are, are totally volunteer, receive no stipend, uh, any, remuner any remuneration at all. Uh, it's, it's an extremely valuable service. And okay. Chief, did you want to comment on account 630? We have it on page 217, the public safety building. Yeah, those have changed. The only change we've made in those basically is, is trying to keep up with the inflation, the rate increases, uh, uh, power uh, for the public safety building, 3,000, water, sewer, and we're doing just uh, standard maintenance, uh, you know, keeping the place from falling apart. We're not doing anything uh, elaborate in hopes of having a new building somewhere down the line. Yeah? <laughs> but there are certain things you've got to do. Uh, I, I guess someone was talking earlier with the police department, <coughs> like lights and stuff. Uh, we had a <coughs> Annie Murray come in the other day, two lights we couldn't get to work. He came in, cost us $35, but you know, you have to get a licensed person to come in and do these things. You have to have a licensed plumber or a, a licensed oil burner man. Uh, another thing that should be done uh, over there, the boiler should be replaced. Uh, not, not, not so much the boiler, but the gun. Uh, that's an old, old gun in there, and, and the, the oil man says we can save 30, 40 percent by putting in a more efficient burner. But uh, we'll, we'll put that off until such time as, you know, there is sufficient funds. Uh, public safety uh, uh, building, uh, heating also includes this building out in, in the back of town hall, propane for that, which has gone up uh, quite a lot. And then you have engine one, that's pretty much standard year after year. 13, 1400 gallons of fuel. Uh, and as I said before, that's got to have some work done to the exterior of the building uh, sometime. It's, uh, yes? I have a question on power. Is that a, a, a um, $4,100 increase? Is that? Well, that was a mistake. That was a. Uh, it was 450, not 400. Yes. Thank you. That was correct. Thank you. Yeah. One of you packed that received the budget or RATA memo. Remember that one? Michael. Yeah, right. <laughs> I didn't transfer the information. I'm oh. sorry. I did note that it was off. Oh. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I did not, yeah, that helped us to the tune. Those are rather helped us to the tune of 1600. So at least it was the right way. Well, Chief, uh, any other clarifications? Billy? Um, I was going to give you a <coughs> What about the burner of engine one? That's not a problem. That's not a problem. No. It's fairly efficient. Yeah. I should think if we could save 30, 40 percent, as they tell you, on the fuel, the burner should be replaced. Well. What's it cost to replace it? Uh, he didn't give me a price, but he said, you, it, I certainly can get you a figure. That's no problem. But he said you really ought to think about it, because these burners are much more efficient now. Well, I think we ought to look at it. So if you could get a surprise, you could get the Sure, I'd be glad to. But if it was truly 30%, we could do that and save the money in the heating company the same year. Well, I it wouldn't really be costing more. Yeah. But I would like to know what it would cost. And if we replace that burner, if, if, if the building over here would have yes. that, if, would that burner be sufficient for any additions? Well, that's, that's another thing I think that's should be looked into, you know, to replace it now and then two years down the line find it's not big enough to heat the entire complex. Uh, but we might be able to get that from the old man, from the uh, from the burner, burner man. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
but I'll, I'll be glad to get a price for the first, of, first of the week. Any other clarifications? Wait, I just have a comment I really feel compelled to make to these folks. And part of it's my response to a memo from the Board of Engineers meeting. And I and I've heard you reiterate this in a little different tone today. I appreciate the tone today more than I appreciated the tone of that memo. I assume the tone of that memo was from the heat and the emotion of that meeting. And just for you folks to be aware, yes, you're presenting what you have told us is a reasonable budget. You want to have a viable department, and you're only asking for what you feel you need. And for you to keep in mind that this is what we hear from every department, and we really have to look at everything in the whole. We realize that. Yeah. I just want to make a comment. I was at that meeting, and uh, when the Board of Engineers discussed it, and I, I hope that nobody was offended by that memo. I wasn't, um, because I think that the uh, volunteer spends uh, a lot of time trying to decide how to say what it was that they were trying to say. So, just I would like to thank the volunteers for all that. Thank you. Well, certainly, again, as chair of the Finance Committee, I just want to extend uh, the appreciation of the Council in general uh, to our fire department. Uh, we've made the point over and over again that the volunteer nature of the 100 individuals that serve Cape Elizabeth is just such an extraordinary uh, gift to the town. It's uh, impossible to really thank you enough. We, we do our best in terms of the budgeting uh, story to fund <coughs> what is uh, appropriate uh, and necessary. Uh, and even at that, at least uh, lean fiscal uh, time to, to come in with a budget uh, really uh, seven percent uh, uh, down, which is uh, I think uh, extraordinary. We'll have to address the issue of the new uh, uh, truck, uh, and that's just something that we've got to, uh, uh, to take a very serious look at. Uh, I'm only struck reading recently that uh, three. Uh, uh, firefighters were killed in Philadelphia at the at high rise uh, situation, the captain and two others. And this just uh, underscores the fact that you people really put yourself on the line uh, anytime there's a, a fire. Uh, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we we'll take about a three or four minute break and we'll continue with emergency preparedness. Begin with account 240. Is that correct, Mr. Manager? Yeah, what I'd like to do is just to finish the 200 accounts. Uh, at this point, we were scheduled to do emergency preparedness, but then that sort of leaves hanging. The only other one is the miscellaneous pro public protection on page 119. Rather than having shuffle papers when we come back after lunch for a whole hour, it might be easy just to catch this at this point. It, it would, really wouldn't take us an hour to shuffle those papers. No. Well, but with all the other accounts, we need to look at it that <laughs> one. Anyway, the uh, these accounts fund street lights, hydrant rental, harbor master, uh, weights and measures, and harbor enforcement expenses. Uh, the street light budget includes a 6% <coughs> increase from central main power. Uh, I'm really, it's, I, I read in yesterday morning's paper that they're looking for another rate increase. 17. 17. 34. Yeah, you never know in the end how those things are going to turn out. This does not provide for any new street lights. Uh, it's uh, it's really a, a frozen position as far as street lights. The hydrant rental account uh, assumes that there will be no rate increase. The water district's last rate increase was a year or so ago, which was a tremendous increase. One problem they're having is the fact that their projections have not come in. At, the revenues have not come in at the level they projected. So I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, on it, but uh, even if they do put a rate, proposed rate increase together, it probably wouldn't uh, affect us in the next 12 months. Uh, the Harbor Master, I, that is one stipend I have not increased primarily for the reason because with the economy, when he's not getting all the demand and the activity for additional moorings and some of those issues as, as we faced a year or two ago, but, it, but there does have to be a continuing uh, effort to just keep going what is there. Uh, weights and measures, that pays for supplies and power enforcement supplies so between the two of them, it's a total of 400. The emergency preparedness budget, uh, beginning on page 122, is down 12%, but as you can see, it's a very small budget, only a total of $3,500. It does provide for uh, continued 
uh, maintenance of uh, the emergency operating center at Fort Williams Park, uh, as, including the utilities for that, as well as for the heat and uh, a few other miscellaneous supplies. Uh, Greg Tinsman, the director, I think is doing a fine job and uh, has all the sheets that you have before you, extending into page 128. So that's, if you have any questions on the civil defense budget, which is a total of 3,500, we have to answer. I have a question on the building maintenance section of that budget. Yes. Um, it's requested for $500 and only what work is proposed to be done in that. Do you have anything specific? It, it, it's not specific. Yeah, just yesterday approved a bill for repairs to the heating system. It added up to $100. The problem we have down there is it's uh, extremely damp. I think most of you have reported it at one point or another. And we do very minimal work. They have done some, but it's one of those facilities. It's just every year you need to put a little bit into it. And, uh, the 500 assumes that some issues will come up during the year. Well, I would think you would need that. Talked about it before to be humidified, mm. to, and it would eliminate some of that maintenance work that's being done in the summer to the moisture. Yeah, they do have a they do have one that's running at times. They run at times. At times, it doesn't run constantly. Okay. If it ran constantly, it would run constantly. You, you know, you'd probably be spending about a thousand dollars a year uh, to get the moisture out. Am I saying something that doesn't make any sense? I'm getting looks. No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> what, what does this do to the radio, all that extra moisture? It doesn't do them a whole lot of good. Why can't we do something about it? Well, we, we, we get by. It, it, it is a problem. Uh, and, it, you know, ultimately, and I had a discussion as late as yesterday with Greg about it, we're hoping that when the public safety facilities are addressed, that perhaps an area could be set aside for civil defense that would uh, replace this particular uh, location. But uh, you know, in the meantime, we're hoping to hang in there and uh, work with it and, and recognize that it does have some advantages as well as disadvantages. Michael, Mr. Tinsman <coughs> recommends a bit of a change this year in terms of uh, creating a new account that would combine five other, uh, call them sub-accounts. Is that uh, in your opinion, a reasonable uh, change? Yes, it is, and as you can see, it, it's essentially what's proposed on page 122. Uh, they, all those things appeared in 3006 account. Any concerns or discussion about that particular change? All right, uh, perhaps just before uh, Mr. Malley begins, Councillor McLaughlin had uh, indicated she might like to just recoup the uh, running uh, let's revisit uh, column before we got into our next uh, series. Um, as I have it right now, certainly the whole issue of the police department's uh, circumstances with the detective uh, uh, position needs to be revisited. Uh, Chief Webster has gone back uh, and will be uh, trying to give us some figures about the uh, burner situation at the uh, public safety building. Uh, other items people have to revisit. One other one I would like to keep open is the probably outlay in the police department to look at their light bars. Okay. All right, fine. With that, I will welcome Mr. Malley, our uh, Director of Public Works, to our budget, and let us uh, jump right into account uh, 310. I could make a, an opening comment. Uh, if you look at page 129, uh, the bottom line is the Public Works budget <coughs> proposed at a level $200,000 less than last year, or 26%. Uh, it is really taking a severe hit, and uh, you know I think uh, I'm getting to sound like a broken record, but uh, one concern I have in this budget and across all the others is that as we look at the budget impact schedule, which is in the the back of your budget books, it shows that next year and the year after and the year after that you know we should have been at a certain spending level. And I think whenever we defer and delay items, 
we begin to cause problems. Those are the light bars that, you know, if those had been funded early, we wouldn't be dealing with it now. Uh, a concern I do have, and it relates to the positions, is that we do need to find some permanent savings. Items that aren't going to come back and kick us in the face again another year from now. And, uh, you know, I have a real regret and a, a disappointment in this whole budget is that I had hoped to find more permanent savings than I did. Uh, I, I fell quite a bit short of where I wanted to be. And because, you know, if you look at this account, there's only one item that's really permanent savings. The, uh, the others, you know, sidewalks and roads and equipment, you know, those are, gonna, those are going to come back. The, the roads continue to, to deteriorate. And if you delay it too long, every study has shown that you end up spending more money than you would spend to begin with. So, uh, you know, I think as you, as you look at this budget and all of them, again, caution you that we do need to find some permanent savings uh, so that next year and the year after we're not, uh, you know, there won't be as much of the, the items to defer to cut. So, so we would be in a, a really difficult situation. So with that, I would like to again appreciate, Bob, uh, say how much I appreciate Bob's uh, excellent presentation uh, as well as his uh, devotion to meeting the target that was given to him. Uh, I, I gave his department a target and he uh, did come in and met it and uh, it was by far the, the toughest. Uh, Welcome again. Thank you. Uh, I don't want to repeat what the manager said, but I think as you can see by my cover letter that uh, doing the budget this year was an extremely discouraging and frustrating process. And you know, we were given target dates and we had to look at all areas. And as a result of that, we had to reduce programs, uh, eliminate personnel, and eliminate purchases of capital equipment. And no department head likes to do that. I know the police and fire departments uh, face the same battle. And in our area, we had to look at a full-time position, which uh, I'll talk about in a few minutes. But I was very discouraged uh, to have to eliminate that position this year. Public works uh, gains more and more responsibilities and duties each year. Even though there's a bad economy, our duties remain the same. You know, our streets still have to be plowed and maintained, and um, uh, lawns have to be mowed and maintained. So our work really doesn't change, regardless of whether times are good or times are bad. But I understand the situation with the budget, and I'm acutely aware that we need to reduce our costs. And my hope is that uh, that these cuts are temporary, and that when things get better that these will be restored but as far as uh, just a quick outline of the budget there's really um, most of the accounts have been kept uh, at status quo uh, we've planned a few minor capital purchases uh, some that are really required and some that are very necessary but there really isn't a whole lot in here and uh, we're trying to maintain what we did last year um, but it's, it's not a pretty sight to put it bluntly so I guess with that, we could start with full-time payroll unless you have any questions immediately. Just one comment. If you look at page 129, you know, echoing the point Bob just made, if you look at the, last, the next to last column, the one next to the percentage, it lists all the variances. And there's a lot of zeros there. That, is, that means, I think that shows two things. One is that there's been an attempt throughout the, all of the budgets to absorb the impact of inflation. Which is, which is at 6%, and that, that you'll see by the fact that there's, there's a lot of errors. Second, we, we've really tried to avoid nickel and diming a whole lot of areas, uh, or wishful thinking cuts. Maybe, maybe we won't get, maybe we'll get a winter like we had this winter. Maybe this will happen, maybe that will happen. I think if, if we do a whole lot of wishful thinking cuts, as opposed to cuts that we can actually realize and know that we can realize, uh, if we did the wishful thinking cuts, we'd find ourselves in a really tough problem in terms of uh, where we would perhaps stand at the end of the year. So in all of the reductions that you see, uh, they're on the basis of things that really can be achieved. Uh, we can say that we're not going to pay as much, that we're not going to have this person uh, on staff. And, uh, there's been a real attempt made to do that. Um, Full-time payroll, there's two major changes that are highlighted here. Uh, the account is showing a reduction 
even with a 5% proposed increase. Uh, the first major change is the uh, increase of a, to a grade level 31 in the pay classification plan of the public works supervisor and to make that position a salary position. Uh, some of you will remember last year during your council uh, deliberations on the budget that there was a concern that the supervisor <coughs> position was being paid less than the mechanic uh, garage foreman's position and that that person really <coughs> in my absence is uh, second in command of the department. He is responsible for all its operations in my absence and should uh, be paid accordingly <coughs> for that work. So uh, that change is, is what you see there. Uh, it is a considerable increase uh, over last year, but to do that, uh, it was necessary to bring it up to that grade level 31. So that is a response to, you know, I agree with the change, and it's, it's probably long overdue. We, traditionally, the garage foreman's position was always uh, paid more than the public works uh, supervisor or highway working foreman, and I don't know why that changed was. I don't know the reasons behind that, but uh, I think this brings it up to an appropriate level and I think that it brings it in standing with the other departments and their command structures. The other change is uh, obviously the deletion of one equipment operator position and it shows a reduction uh, because of that. And again, uh, understanding the concerns of the budget and, and uh, the fiscal problems that we have, I'm, I'm not in favor of it, but I think it's something that we can live with on the short term. But in my five-year budget impact schedule, originally I had an additional person in there for the Parks Division, but I did not put that in. But, um, our work is changing, and, and in the Parks Division, we could use another full-time position. And, and there are times in the Highway Division that we could use another full-time position. So you really hate to see a person go, and not, not a person, I should say, but a position, because I'm fearful that once that position leaves, it's very, very difficult to get it back. Again, our work is, is, uh, is always there. Uh, as a result of losing that position, I have to hire a part-time person uh, to plow snow, and it's becoming very difficult <coughs> to find these part-time people. We have a very uh, good group of dedicated people right now, but because of conflicting work schedules, sometimes they're not always available. And uh, because of that, we have to try to find one more person, and uh, the last particular snowstorm, I was in a truck plowing snow because of that. So these are the, uh, the manpower constraints that uh, we're working with, and it's, uh, it's very difficult. You have people on vacation in the summertime, and we have a number of operators that uh, have some time in, and they're up in the three and four week vacation bracket. And during the summer months, when there's two men on vacation, and there's one at the transfer station chipping brush, and one assisting with mowing lawns at the uh, parks department, it only